All right, everybody, this is Sheets, and I'm going to be going over the MMA uh, card for this Saturday, December 3rd, and I'm going to be completely taking the, the betting approach to this video. And it's it's really a, it's really interesting since I started getting involved in the in the betting end of this, um, how different it really is, and and from from DFS, and we all knew this instinctively, but remember what we're trying to accomplish here with both DFS and uh, wagering. All right, so when you play DFS, the primary assumption that you have to make. And forgive me if I'm repeating myself, but this is your first time watching this video, I have to repeat this. The primary assumption you have to make in DFS is that the Vegas lines are efficient, that the, the props and the inside the distance lines and the money lines are efficient. And what you do then is derive your DFS takes based on those implied probabilities. Um, and the way you get edge is through lineup construction and through ownership fade and things like that. I mean, we, we all kind of uh, have access to the same Vegas odds. So technically we all should be able to, you know, come up with what the good plays are, you know, based on those assumptions. Okay. Um, now, again, just because you have the best plays doesn't mean you're going to win. Um, you have to know how to put them together. You have to know how to, how to, how to fade ownership and things like that. But that's the over that's the overarching, you know, presumption is that the Vegas lines are accurate. Now, when you want to bet on the fights or bet on anything, the assumption is completely different, right? It, you have to presume if you're going to be betting on these fights that the lines are not efficient. I mean, listen, you're you're paying a VIG of at least a dollar ten, and in most cases, MMA, you're paying a big of much, much more than that. Um, so you have to have an edge over the line to be able to bet profitably. Now, again, I'm not saying that you you have to have an edge to to bet, right? You could bet for fun, you could bet just so you could have a sweat or whatever. But if you're going to attempt to, you know, to make money, um, you're going to have to presume that there's something wrong with the line. And that you know more than the rest of the world does. Um, now, that's not to say that it's impossible, but it's it's a different type of challenge. Let's put it that way: the DFS, where you presume that all the lines are accurate, and you have to get your edge in different ways. Um, so, the way that I analyze again wagering, whether it be on, you know, MMA fights, basketball games, football games, even the stock market again, I've spoken, spoken about this before, is you have to presume the following, that the market is somewhat efficient, meaning that the line is what it is, okay? But to get an edge, you have to figure out what of that line has been caused by kind of narrative stuff. What of that line is caused by, by nonsense, what if that line is caused by psychology? What if that line is caused by, you know, bias from the public as opposed to whatever else should be going into probabilities, meaning, you know, data and, and, and things like that. Um, to give again, that's but one stock market example I always use. If you tell me that a stock is $70 and then the stock is an incredibly easy story to tell, that you can explain to your five-year-old why this is a great company, it's probably a terrible buy because it, that ability to tell that story in a very easy way is part of what goes into the, you know, the, the ownership of that stock. Um, so in a similar way, when you're trying to analyze where value is in, let's just say MMA fighting, you know, you have to figure out what is the overwhelming bias associated with a fight? What do people want to happen in a fight? What of a particular line is generated by, by kind of psychology and narrative as opposed to other stuff? And if you could figure that out, then you could at least you know, have a shot to, to have some kind of an edge. Now, again, you're never gonna, gonna be able to prove that, 
But I think that, you know, years and years of experience in dealing with these types of things gives me a certain kind of jadedness that I, I've been able to, this is really res what's responsible for, you know, 80% of my success in my hedge fund over the years is being able to gauge the psychology around a, a price. And we're going to do the same thing as we've been doing with, uh, with MMA fighting. Now, again, just in terms of, of, uh, of structure, I'm always going to bet on every fight on every card during this, during this process. Okay. I'm not going to be passing. I'm not going to be saying one unit versus eight units or anything like that. Um, this is just kind of an exercise in showing everybody, you know, how to think about this type of thing. And the other thing is that I just want to put my money where my mouth is so that you guys know that I am betting literally everything that I recommend. And just so you know exactly how much it's going to be, it's going to be $180 for each individual wager. So far for the season, um, we, since we've been doing this, we're up four, I guess, four units. So four times 180 total. Um, so, so far, so good. And as you'll see, the, the, the takes are not exactly the types of takes that you're going to be used to from other MMA content providers, because I'm just kind of looking at it from a completely unique, I think, a uh, unique way of, of analyzing these things. Um, okay, so first of all, let's take a look uh, right at the first fight of the night, which is uh, Yasmin uh, Jaragui, or whoever, versus Estela Nunez. And again, part of being able to do this is, is being able to absorb content, being able to absorb takes. So you, it does require a little bit of research to be able to gauge what, what psychology there is out there. And the one thing that I've, I've known, I've, I've found is there's an overwhelming consensus that this line is too wide. Okay, if you ask about, you know, if, if you gauge about 30 different takes out there, you'll hear that, well, Yasmin is, is probably gonna win, but this line is way too wide, okay? So the way I look at that is, if that's what the, con if that's what the consensus is, then my probably opinion is that it's probably not too wide and that, uh, and that Yasmin is probably, probably should be like minus 500. Um, so we're going to be betting uh, uh, Yasmin. The only question is exactly how to do that. Um, I don't really want to just lay the minus 315, although, I mean, that, that, that is kind of would, would be the, the correct way to, to profit off of, the, off of the take because there's not really any particular lean on how this fight is going to go. Um, so what we're going to do is we're just going to go with, you know, what we're going to do, we're going to put her off to the side and we're going to use her in a parlay. Okay. We're going to put, no, we can't do that. Cause it's gotta be 180 per fight. So, you know what, let's just eat it. Then we'll, we'll just take Yasmin minus the 315 for 180. Okay. Um, I just don't, there's no other way to, to do this, but. I, I do think that that playing Nunez is the bad side, is the unsharp side, and that you're probably better off just taking Yasmin at minus 315. Um, okay, so I'm going to put this in the bet slip. And you'll just have to trust me that I bet all this after this because I'm not allowed to do it with, um, you see, I'll get an error message here because I'm on Zoom. And they don't like when you're on Zoom. So let me go back to, boy, oh boy. Let's go back to UFC. I just want to get the bet slip open so they don't, I don't forget who we, who we, uh, how do we get all this up here? Um, winning method, fight lines. Okay. Um, so we'll minus 315. 180. Okay. Uh, can we log in? Oh, no. All right. So let's go on to the next fight. That is uh, Natan Levy versus Gennaro Valdez. And um, all I've been hearing pretty much the whole week is that, you know, Valdez is kind of a wild man and that Levy might not be able to take the kind of this kind of pressure and that, and that, uh, and that Valdez is going to give Levy a lot of trouble with his aggression. But if he doesn't, 
then Levy is going to, going to you know, he's going to run him over. The only thing I'm hearing for sure is that there's just no way that this fight goes to decision. Um, so, you know what that means? We are going to bet this fight to go to decision. So um, we're going to get fight props. Fight goes to the distance. Yes, uh, would be minus. Wait, wrong fight. Hold on. Uh, fight goes decision is plus 200 and we'll put that in as well so hold on let's let's put this in let's go back and also let's put the Yasmin bet back in so we don't forget okay um moving on you have Tracy Cortez versus Amanda Hibas and this is what I'm hearing. I'm hearing while well, Cortez is probably, you know, a good wrestler. Uh, he boss has, has you know, pretty good wrestling on her own and that she also has submission skills. And this is really interesting for a pick em fight. I'm seeing about 10 to one um, as far as uh, takes of betting he boss to win uh, over Cortez. So that's good enough for me. I will take Cortez. Now, do I want to play her by decision or just straight up? We'll just go straight up. Cortez minus the 110 for 180. Okay, Jonathan Pierce against Darren Elkins. So the big, you know, you have Jonathan Pierce who's been running over people, but nonetheless, you're getting, I don't know who this Darren Elkins guy is, but all I'm hearing is that he's he's just he's just tough to finish. If, if, if he can just take Jonathan Pierce into deep waters, whatever that means, um, you know, he might actually be able to turn the tables on him and that, you know, Darren Elks has been doing this his whole career, just fighting it off, fighting it off, eating it and then reversing it. So uh, we're just going to, we're just going to play Pierce to finish, but let's just see what kind of odds we can get. Uh, on what round because I want to bet him to finish and I don't know whether it's going to be K or submission, but we'll do it by a round. How about that? Oh, there you go. So Pierce round two plus 400. That looks good. Maybe he beats the crap out of him in round one and then finishes in round two. Um, that makes a lot of sense to me. Um, so we're going to go with that one plus 400 Jonathan Pierce in round two specifically. Michael Johnson versus Mark Diacasey. You have Mark Diacasey, who is going to be going for a zillion takedowns against Michael Johnson. Um, Michael Johnson has just really poor takedown defense. And you hear that styles make fights. And that while Mark Diacasey is going to probably be really boring, he's going to get the job done. So what we're going to do is we're going to do one of two things. I haven't quite figured out what it is. Maybe I'll just flip a coin. We're either, going to be a good, we're either just going to take Michael Johnson plus the 260, or what we're going to do is go back to our old standby and play Diakese to finish in round two. I love these round two finishes because you'd have to think that Diakese is kind of hearing the same crap that he hasn't really finished people. He's a boring fighter. So you get a situation like this where maybe he can get this finish. Um, so we're, we're going to do either Johnson plus 260, Casey by submission, right? Or Casey specifically in round two. Um, I think we're going to go with, let's see what the odds are, right? Let's go with, first of all, round props. Casey round two is a plus 750. That's pretty badass. Okay. Um, DK's by decision minus 115 seems pretty freaking safe though, but it doesn't really fit our narrative. So we're not going to do it. So either DKC plus 750 or by submission, which would be DKC by submission plus 1200. 1200. Does he have any submissions? I mean, if he's going to take him down a billion times, don't you think he can get a submission out of this somehow? Well, I don't know. We're, we're going to... 
I don't know. Maybe I should just take Johnson to, Johnson to win. Um, yeah, you know, let's just do that. And and, and it's funny, like you're like, well, you, this is, this might not make sense to you, but these these are the two sides. As a matter of fact, maybe you do both. Maybe I play Mark D. Casey by submission plus twelve hundred, and Michael Johnson to win. Hmm. Interesting. I want to get back to that one. Maybe I will do them both. No, because it's violating my my rule of what to do. Um. All right. But we'll we'll take Michael Johnson. We'll just take Michael Johnson plus the 260. Fight line, Michael Johnson plus 260, 180. And there you go. Okay, um, moving on. We have Clay Guida against Scott Holtzman. Um, it's supposed to be just kind of a two old guys just kind of not doing much. Um, so let's just go, you know, the, the best I can come up with is any contrarian play is just I'll just bet this to finish inside the distance. So let's do that. So it's either going to be under 2.5 plus 170, or we'll just go doesn't finish plus 130. Well, what's the difference? So I'm costing myself a minute and a half for an extra plus 130 or hang on an extra 40 cents for an extra minute and a half oh, this is awful awful fight um but we'll do it we'll 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 go just inside the distance Plus one thirty for one eighty. Okay, um, moving along, we have. Oh, I like this one. This this could be one of my favorites on the whole card. So Angela Hill versus Emily Dakota. So Angela Hill. This is a perfect example of recency bias plus plus all kinds of good stuff. So Angela Hill was supposed to get taken down by Lupe Godinez like a hundred times and everybody thought that this was going to happen and Angela Hill just stuffed them all you know just did her thing and and really just ruined the lives of people that had Lupe uh, Godinez um Dakota is is kind of in a similar situation like she does have kind of wrestling in her back somewhere but like however it's, people are aligning this to the same thing. So that Angela Hill is just, you know, it just has good takedown defense. And if Lupita Godinez cannot take her down, then Dakota is not going to be able to. And Angela Hill is really, you know, she has a lot of experience. She's fought all the better fighters. So we are going to take Dakota. Um, she, and she's not even an, uh, an underdog. Like who the hell is taking Dakota here? It will be me. So Emily Dakota minus the 120. Looks good enough for me. All right, moving along. We have Nico Price versus Philip Rowe. We have Nico Price, and I love I love these fights. So Nico Price is 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 35 or whatever, and he's definitely on the way out. And and Philip Rowe has a you know, nine-inch reach advantage and a huge height advantage. And Nico Price just does, does nothing but take damage. But you know what you're hearing all week? Is that Nico Price has that dog in him, you know? And and I love fighting against. I love fighting against guys that have that dog in him. We had Olberg against Nigermiano a few few cards ago. Nigermiano had that dog in him. What first round? Boom. Philip Rowe. We're actually getting as an underdog here, so we're going to actually take Philip Rowe inside the distance. So Philip Rowe by KO. Let's see what his price is. Um, winning method. Philip Rowe by KO plus 330. There you have it. 180. Beat that dog in him. In Nico Price. All right. Um, next. 
Jack Hermanson versus Roman Delice. Um, this one's a little bit of a tough one. Um, because you have Roman Delice, who's he did win his, his last fight by by KO, and Hermanson did had just had kind of a boring win over Chris Curtis. And this is kind of what the consensus is going to be that Hermanson is just going to keep it range. He's just more technical and that it's, you know, he's just going to just, just win a nice clean fight. Um, so what we're going to do, this is, this is going to be tough to get home, but we're going to take Hermanson inside the distance here, just because this has not been, this is the take that I have not heard yet. <laughs> Um, let's see what it is. So Hermanson by submission, or let's see what we got here. We'll have Hermanson by submission plus 400. Hermanson by TKO is plus 600. How about a fight prop? Fight doesn't go the distance minus 110. Well, I mean, you could do that. Because if Delice wins, it's probably going to be inside the distance. So let's just do that. It'll be nice and easy. Not even easy, but let's 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 do this. So minus, actually, we don't want to do this because this incorporates the Delizzi win condition that seems to be everybody's favorite win condition. Everybody's saying that Delizzi wins, he's going to be inside the distance. Um, so uh, we're going to fade that part. We're just going to go Hermanson himself. So it will be, what do we have? Winning method. A round prop. Ooh, again, the old round two. Round two. Let's let's do this again. How about Hermanson? Round two. Round three. You can play them both. But let's do. How about either submission or KO? We're we're gonna do Hermanson by 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 submission here. So Hermanson by submission for one eighty plus four hundred. Okay. All right, moving along, we have Eric Anders versus Kyle Dawkins. Um, this is this one is this one's pretty easy. You have, I mean, all. You, I've heard people that are picking Anders. I've heard people that that think this is too wide. Anders is going to bully him up against the cage. Uh, if Kyle Dawkins wins, it's going to be you know maybe a boring decision. Uh, that Anders, you know, I don't want to say has that dog in him, but Kyle Dawkins has this reputation for just not being very you know much of a finisher. So what we're going to do is we are going to bet Kyle Dawkins to finish. We are going to bet him by submission and. Let's see what we get. Can we get two to one? Let's see. Let's see if we can get two to one on him by submission. Winning method. Dawkins by submission plus 275. That looks good. And we will go ahead and do that. Plus the one, 275. Hmm. What's next? Mm -hmm. All right. Tai Tui Vasa versus Sergey Pavlovich. So this is what we have. First of all, you have you have a lot of steam on, on Tui Vasa. Okay. Um, so we're not gonna be we're not gonna be playing the Tui Vasa by KO side. There's only two things that I really want to try in this fight. Again, the, the overwhelming consensus is that, you know, that Sergey, first of all, Sergey hasn't really fought anybody, okay? But he has a big reach advantage or whatever. But two Tuivasa is very live. So we're not going to take Tuivasa here. We're either going to play Sergey in round one or Sergey in round two, which is also not. I don't think that's going to be really popular. The only other thing I could think of is maybe Tuivasa by decision. Um, let's take a look at some of these odds here. 
and see what we can come up with. Um, so first of all, let's see round props. So Sergey round one is not going to be good. See, this this is the one. Sergey in round two plus six hundred. That's just, that's just it. You know, beats him up in round one, gets him in round two. Look at that big difference between round one and round two. I will I will try it. The only look, look at the difference here. This is really interesting. You have a two to one favorite, Sergey. And they're almost the same as far as their round two KO prop. So we're going to go with Sergey plus 600 in round two for the win. Okay. Mateus Nikolaou, that was just match Nell. So... This is what we know for sure about this fight. We have Nikolaou is far more technical. Um, it's not much of a finisher, though. And then we have Matt Schnell, who's just kind of a wild man. Um, and he took a lot of beating from, what's his name? From uh, uh, Sumadarji before finally coming back. So what we're not going to do, we're not playing Schnell you know, round one or anything like that. We're not playing Nikolaou by decision because that's those are the kind of the moto plays. What I think we're going to do is we're going to play either Nikolaou in round one or I think that's got to have to be what we do. Or maybe Nikolaou in round two. You know, let Schnell just kind of, you know, like, like, like put out a little pace and try to do something in round one. Have Nikolaou hurt him a little bit and then get him around too. Let's see if we can't get a really big number on either of those two things. Let's take a look at this. Nikolaou in round one, plus 250. Oh, this is round two is plus 550. Can Schnell make it to round three? Boy, this is so tempting to just, just hope that he just gets to round three. And then Nikolaou just gets him. That's 10 to 1. I think I'm going to have to try it. It's hard. It's hard. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it. We're, 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 we're going to do it. Boy, oh boy. Wasn't expecting this. Started off like nice and tame with a 3 to 1 favorite. Now I'm, just, now I'm on tilt with these 10 to 1 shots. But let's go. Can't believe anybody's doing this, which is means probably a good bet. Okay, this one no one's gonna like. Um, so we have Brian Barberina against Rafael dos Anjos, and Rafael dos Anjos has the the much better competition. He ha has Brian Barberino covered everywhere, um, and he's gonna take him down. Styles make fights, easy game. However, if it were that easy, there wouldn't be bookmakers. So what we're going to do is, is, is turn a, a narrative right against people. All I hear about, in, when not all I hear about, but I hear quite often that when one guy is about eight years younger than the other guy, he's got a big advantage. And why now? is is does that not matter you have this guy who's like a five minus 500 favorite okay dos años and the same logic applies here i mean barbarino there's nothing wrong with him he has okay he hasn't fought the competition yet but you know what, what do you want him to do you know it's not like he has a losing record or anything like that he's got some wins he's coming up and 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 it's the typical thing. And Dos Anjos is kind of kind of on the way down. You know, he he okay. He he's how do you just have a main event fight, which is what he had, and how how do you get up for a fight against Brian Barberina coming off of a main event fight? It seems almost impossible. So what I'm saying is this, okay, that you are going to get Brian Barberina's best effort, and you're not going to get Dos Anjos's. Is that going to be enough? Well. Plus 430, we will find out. So 
Ryan Barberina, plus one four thirty. Ouch. Um, I feel like I'm missing a fight here, but we'll get back to them all when we recap. Um, okay, so here we go. Stephen Thompson versus Kevin Holland. I mean, to me, this is this is easy. So Stephen Thompson is done. He's finished. He's 39 years old. He's old. That's that's that yeah, it's the end of the line. Kevin Holland, I mean, he's just gonna, you know, he's he's almost as good of a striker. He has takedown upside as well. And this will be Stephen Thompson's maybe last fight. Look what happened to him in his last two fights. He got taken down repeatedly. Probably Kevin Holland can do that if he feels like it. And it's easy money. Let me let me explain something to you. So Stephen Thompson was old three fights ago as well. And he fought a pure striker named Jeff Neal. And Steve Thompson, Stephen Thompson just, just destroyed it. I mean, he pieced him up all over the place for five rounds. It was not even remotely competitive. Jeff Neal went on to have a really nice KO, like just in his last fight. Okay, so Stephen Thompson had impossible matchups against pure like grapplers. Kevin Holland is not a grappler. Okay. And you want to give me plus money on Stephen Thompson? Um, as against another striker, I will take it. So plus 145, 180 sounds good to me. So the problem is here is that I only see how many wages are there here? It says 13, but there's 15 fights. So what am I missing? Oh, I'm missing the first two. So let's, uh, Let's go back all the way to the beginning. Um, okay. We'll put this in. Uh, Jasmine. 180. And as we do this, we'll review. What did we say we were doing with... Um, hang on. Levy Valdez. So Marshall Rojo. What do we say we were doing with with Marshall Rojo? We were gonna play. Mar was it Marshall in round two? No, we we're just gonna go Marshall. No, we were just gonna play uh, to to. I don't remember what I was gonna do there. So now we have to re reanalyze this. What do we say? It was Rojo was going to give Marshall trouble. So we're going to fade that. We're going to take Marshall and it was going to be Marshall by submission, right? Is that the story? Well, that's what we are going to do. So, uh, if I gave something else, I apologize. We changed our mind. So now we are going to review. We have uh, no particular order. Levy Valdez plus two hundred to go to the distance. Cortez minus the one ten. We have Jonathan Pearson round two plus four hundred. Michael Johnson plus two sixty. How does that ever winning? Um, Guida Holtzman fight finishes plus one thirty. Emily Dakota money line minus one twenty. Philip Rowe by TKO or KO plus three thirty. Jack Hermanson win by submission plus 400. Dalkus wins by submission plus 275. Sergey in round two precisely plus 600. Nikolau in round three plus 10 to one. Brian Barbarina plus 430. Stephen Thompson plus 145. Let's go. Um, good luck, everybody. Feels like going 0 15. We'll find out.